Each day, just before dawn, countless Hindus rise and take a bath. Most live in India, but they also are in places as distant as Singapore and Washington, D.C. Their early morning bath cleanses not only their bodies, but their spirits as well. Many more Hindus proceed with a ritual known as a puja. This is an act of worship during which they burn incense and make offerings of flowers, fruits, milk, or sweets to a statue or a picture of one among the hundreds of Hindu gods, goddesses, or spirits. Some may undertake the system of exercise known as yoga. They practice breath control, sitting for hours in the so-called lotus position. Hinduism embraces a wide variety of beliefs and practices. Indeed, some Hindu doctrines and practices seem almost to contradict one another, as the very old mixes with the very new. The Sanskrit word Veda most generally means truth or knowledge, and it is related to the English word wit. But the word Veda is most often used specifically to refer to ancient Hindu scriptures. The earliest portions of the Vedic library are organized into four separate collections of verse called Samhitas. The Rik Samhita alone contains over 1,000 separate hymns, with more than 10,000 verses divided into 10 books. According to the Hindu belief, inspired sages, known as Rishis, heard these verses directly from the gods. Each of these religious poems usually addresses one of the Vedic gods or goddesses or spirits, each of whom represents natural forces such as the sun, the moon, and the wind. The god mentioned most often is Indra, who resembles Zeus of Greek mythology. Many poems in the Rik Samhita honor Indra's majesty and power. I praise the most pure Indra, whose mighty work separated the earth from the sky. Indra drives the sun like a swift chariot to bring him here to his worshippers. Like a river, he is always active but never rests. He destroys the darkness with light. In ancient Hindu worship and sacrifice, the 1,028 hymns of the Rig Veda were chanted during religious ceremonies. Some of those verses are still recited at weddings, funerals, and initiation rites. Just the act of reciting them is sacred, and their very sound is holy. Modern scholars don't know all the details of the religious rituals practiced during the Vedic age, but they do know that poetry from the Rik Samhita was chanted as part of several highly complicated rites. These rituals could take weeks, months, or even a year to perform. They also required the presence of many priests, each specializing in some part of the ceremony. 
During the Vedic age, the most specialized devotional activity was the Soma ritual. Soma was a liquid produced by crushing some form of vegetation. Priests collected the plant as they sang hymns about searching for and cutting down the Soma plant. The Brahmanas, which were composed somewhere between the years 1000 and 800 BCE, adopt almost a shrill tone in defending both the importance of rituals and the practice of giving many gifts to the priests who perform them. Indeed, many of the Upanishads, the last 300 or so books of the Vedic library, were berating a Vedic religious system that would soon die out and be replaced. In fact, the earliest Vedic texts never mention the belief and practices that a modern person usually associates with Hinduism. The Samhitas indicated that ancient Indians ate beef, but over the centuries the cow became a sacred animal, a symbol of the earth's fertility. Eating beef became a sin. The first Vedas described an afterlife. Later, the Upanishads introduced a different idea, reincarnation. Hindus thus came to believe that unenlightened souls are trapped in a continuous cycle of birth and death. Moksha, freedom from the painful cycle of rebirth and redeath, became the goal of those who focused their efforts on meditation and self-discipline. Vedic beliefs and practices probably were eclipsed by religious revolts against the dominance of priests and their elaborate rituals. The religious traditions of Jainism and Buddhism, which both had begun in the 6th century BCE, would become the most famous of these protest movements. Buddhism and Jainism was in part, in this, at this time period, a reaction against the caste system. The caste system is comprised of four levels, which is the Brahmins, which are the priests, the Kshatriyas, which are the warriors, the Vaishyas, which are the laborers, and the Shudras, which are the untouchables. Now, these castes were strict, and you could not pass easily between castes. If you were a woman, you could pass, but through marriage, but if you were a male, you were stuck to your caste. You were born into a caste, and you had to follow the behavior of that caste. Brahmins were in charge of these rituals. And if not Brahmins, then the higher castes were in charge of these rituals. So this ritual obsession created large segments of the population that were alienated, totally alienated from any spirituality, religious, uh, religious belief, because they couldn't really partake in these rituals. They might be able to employ a Brahmin to do these rituals, but they really weren't partaking in the rituals themselves. They were alienated from them. So this is one reason why uh, Buddhism and Jainism developed, is a reaction against this caste and ritual extremism. Philosophical and ethical doctrines of the Jains and Buddhists changed the character of Hinduism. The Vedic rituals gradually faded into the background after the 6th century BCE, and a new era in the development of Hinduism began. In 326 BCE, the troops of Alexander the Great crossed the Indus River in northwest India. For some time, it had been apparent that an attack was coming, and the rulers of various Indian territories already had banded together. This created what would become known as the Mauryan Empire. As it turned out, Alexander's soldiers refused to go any farther than the Indus River. But Indian politics already had changed. In about 250 BCE, Ashoka became emperor of the Mauryan dynasty. He expanded the empire through fierce wars of conquest, during which hundreds of thousands died. Ashoka sickened of the bloodshed and turned to the Buddhist faiths for consolation. He dramatically influenced Indian religious life by offering patronage to Buddhists. Royal support for Buddhism and Jainism 
continued for about a thousand years, and this partly accounts for the absence of distinctly Hindu religious monuments before the 9th century CE. Though little evidence of Hindu religious buildings has survived, libraries show that Hinduism was indeed responding to the challenges posed by Buddhists and Jains, though in an intellectual rather than a physical way. Hinduism's response took one of two forms. First, Hindus restructured their philosophical and theological systems. They elaborated upon or argued against ideas developed by Buddhists and Jains. For example, Hindus accepted the belief of rebirth and redeath. They took up other concepts, such as karma, which adds up the negative and positive influences generated by good and bad deeds. Hindus also embrace the idea that karma can have an impact that carries on through several incarnations. But they rejected the notion that the Buddha had learned the way to salvation. A second type of Hindu response emphasized the worship of personal divinities. The gods who became the focus of this devotion were not the same as those found in the Vedic texts. Vishnu, Shiva, Krishna and Rama now came to prominence, while Indra and the rest declined. The Upanishads had contained some early indications of the Hindu philosophical response to Buddhism and Jainism. For example, the Taittiriya Upanishad begins with several statements that almost directly quote from Buddhist treatises. Yet as it proceeds, the Taittiriya Upanishad concludes that there is a real self, something which the Buddhists deny. Hindu philosophers and theologians began to systemize ideas that had not been fully worked out in the Upanishads. In the late 8th and early 9th century CE, a talented philosopher named Shankara would become the most celebrated exponent of the position which eventually became known as Advaita Vedanta. Advaita literally means not to. Advaita Vedanta therefore claims that the ultimate Brahman and the individual self or Atman are one and the same. Shankara said that the gods are lower forms of the one Brahman. He said people do not harm themselves by worshipping a personal god. Shankara himself was a devotee of the god Shiva. But Shankara believed that eventually each person must go beyond dependence on individual deities. He said that each of us will realize that all distinct gods are imperfect reflections of what he called the Brahman without qualities. Shankaracharya's Advaita Vedanta, sure enough, is a very strong position in India. The question is, is why is it such a strong position? German romanticists in the 19th century, uh, and most notably Schopenhauer, took an, a great interest in Advaita Vedanta. Why? Because it was non-dual. And this was most dissimilar to the traditions that these German romanticists saw pervading Europe in this time period. So rather than looking at things that were like their own traditions and say other dualist positions, they really looked towards non-dualism. Although this position is certainly interesting and certainly is one that many Hindus today follow and certainly one that most people equate with Hinduism, not all Hindus believe this position. And there are dual positions, dualist positions, Dvaita positions, where the Atman and the Brahman are regarded as separate, as distinct, as two. The early centuries of the Common Era saw an enormous burst of creative energy in India. There were plays, poetry, stories and many other forms of literature that expressed this new creativity within Hindu civilization. Two works came to have both literary and religious significance. One was an epic poem called the Mahabharata, a rough translation of the title Mahabharata might be the great book of the Bharatas. Bharat was the ancestor of two royal families, the Kuravas and the Pandavas. 
five Pandava princes have gambled away their right to rule in a dice game. The Kauravas won the kingdom, which was to be returned to the Pandavas after a span of 13 years. But in the 13th year, the Kauravas did not fulfill their promise. The result was the great Bharata War. Some 18 chapters of the Mahabharata have become sacred scripture in their own right. These 18 chapters are known collectively as the Bhagavad Gita, which means the Song of God. The Gita is a dialogue between a Pandava prince, Arjuna, and his chariot driver, who is the Hindu god Krishna in human form. Krishna instructs Arjuna about the nature of reality. At one point, Arjuna looks across the battlefield towards the Kurava army. In the opposing ranks, he sees his cousins, an old teacher, and other friends. He's filled with dread and remorse at the thought of having to kill them. Throughout the Gita, Krishna listens patiently as Arjuna frets about the potential consequences of such murderous actions. Krishna refutes each of Arjuna's objections and he reveals that he is truly God. The warrior Arjuna soon learns that Krishna decrees the course of every event and Krishna tells Arjuna that his divinely established duty is to fight. We must not forget that Arjuna is a warrior. He's born as a warrior. And Krishna is merely suggesting to him that he should follow his swadharma, his nature, his self-nature, which is as a kshatriya, as a warrior, to fight, regardless of his relationship with his opponents. So, in for that matter, for Arjuna to do otherwise, for example, to follow the swadharma, the nature of a brahmin, another caste, a priest caste, he would be doing the worst thing possible. Arjuna is a warrior, a warrior's swadharma duty is to fight. Arjuna must fight. Krishna declares that no evil karma will arise as long as Arjuna focuses on the task itself and performs it without a desire for self-gain. As Krishna says to Arjuna, These bodies come to an end, but the scriptures declare the eternity of the soul, which is indestructible and unfathomable. Therefore fight, O son of Bhagavad. Those who believe themselves killers and those who think that they are really slain do not truly understand. They are neither killers nor are they killed. Hindu civilization has a very long history. Its more literate and educated members have a tendency to preserve older cultural forms. They accept newer ones as nothing more than extensions of the previous system. New forms and new ideas simply add more layers of culture, coexisting with the older beliefs and customs. Some observers have mistaken this persistence of older forms for changelessness and stagnation, but it also provides a sense of permanence, while at the same time accommodating massive change. The Hindu religion doesn't have any specific founder. Like there's many beliefs that are inherent in the tradition. Some people take a devotional belief towards the Supreme. Some follow the path of jnana, which is um, a path of knowledge or recognition. There's many different approaches. There's karma yoga, which is the path of selfless service. All these things. So almost any tradition or any belief that's followed, it has some parallel in the Hindu tradition. The symbol may be slightly different, but what it represents is paralleled in the Hindu tradition. In India, you might be in a house where there's three or four people, and each one could be approaching the Supreme in a different way. In fact, the house may even have a Christian living there, and someone else in the house may be a Hindu living in the same house. And they all have respect and honor each other. Because the whole foundation of Hinduism is this one God that appears in many ways. In another category of books, called the Dharma Shastras, or law books, the priestly or Brahmanical writers of India described life as a series of logical categories. For instance, they neatly divided a male's life, though not a woman's life, into stages. In youth, the boy should be a student, 
who learns the Vedas from a wise older teacher. Then he should become a householder who takes responsibility for reproducing and preserving the material world. An aging man should gradually move away from the things of this world. While the laws of Manu advocate strict celibacy for young men, another Hindu text from the early centuries CE, the Kama Sutra, offers instruction on the various ways that mature men and women can enjoy the physical pleasures of love. The Kama Sutra has become a famous or even infamous sex manual. The Kama Sutra goes on to describe in somewhat metaphoric language an amazing number of techniques for making love. There might seem to be a contradiction here between the enjoyment of the body and cultivation of the soul. But we should remember that Hindus believe different forms of behavior are appropriate to different stages of life. The student should be celibate and the householder should be involved in physical passion. This approach seems to put things in their appropriate place. Such attempts to include every human possibility in their system has led some people to speak of Hinduism as a way of life rather than a religion in the usual European and American sense. Yet another dimension of the Hindu way of life emerged in what might be called the early Middle Ages of India. This new dimension was a highly developed system of astrology and it has continued to be an important part of Hindu life. Lengthy manuals on the subject became widely available and the sidewalk astrologer became an important figure in every village and town. For important tasks such as arranging a marriage, the horoscopes of both bride and groom received careful scrutiny. Horoscopes were also consulted to choose the most auspicious day for the wedding. In this way, the stars, the phases of the moon, the days of the month, and the hours of the day all figure prominently in the lives of ordinary Hindus. Astrology thus joins water as one of the common practical elements of Hinduism. Hindus, Jews, Christians and Muslims all use water both physically and symbolically, as a purifying substance. Christians experience new life through baptism. Muslims must wash before they pray in order to purify themselves. Likewise, Hindus look upon bathing as an act that removes any form of pollution, and it is one of the reasons that most Hindus bathe every morning. Hindus consider the Ganges River in northern India to be the purest water in the world. Many Hindus believe that bathing in the Ganges River removes all sin. Older people sometimes choose to spend their last days on its banks, especially in one of the holy cities through which the river flows. After they die, they will be cremated and their ashes set afloat on the river. During the 4th and 5th centuries CE, Hinduism re-emerged as the dominant religion of India after overcoming the challenges by Buddhism and Jainism. The many thousands of grand temples built in the period were only the most obvious symbols of a Hindu renaissance. Ellora, located in central India near the city of Aurangabad, features a number of caves which have been extended and decorated by generations of stone carvers. But the most impressive of the monuments at Ellora is the 8th century Kailasana temple, which was dedicated to Shiva. In building temples, the iconography, that is the visual symbolism of religious statuary, became very important. In cultures where few people could read, familiar symbols helped the illiterate understand the message conveyed in religious buildings. the various gods and the stories of their feats acquired a standard form of presentation. For example, Shiva was sometimes portrayed as dancing. The religious idea here is that Shiva's dance keeps the universe in motion. Another image of Shiva is that of the Mahayogi, the cosmic meditator. 
These images present Shiva sitting in the lotus position, his eyes nearly shut and focused on the tip of his nose. Like other wandering holy men, Shiva sits on the skin of an animal. His hair is piled high on his head, and from it the sacred Ganges is said to flow. The implication is that Shiva's meditation creates and sustains the universe. Images of the Hindu gods are housed in temples, and they are treated as though they were persons. The images are worshipped through prayers and offerings of food. They are frequently bathed and given fresh clothing. Jews, Christians and Muslims tend to think of worshipping images as idolatry. But Hindus know that God exists in a spiritual way and cannot be limited to a painting or a statue. Though they display great regard for the images themselves, Hindus actually worship what the images represent. You see, in the, in the Hindu way of looking at things, there's one God that appears in many ways. And the deities are crystallizations of these principles. It's the same universal consciousness in each deity, but it's a different nature of God or a different flavor of God that the deity represents. And for instance, the aspect of God that removes all obstacles, that's personified as Ganesh. But underneath is the same omnipotent consciousness. When Hindu devotees go to a particular temple, they perform the rituals of puja, that is, worship involving an offering of food and prayers to the image of the god. The deity is believed to absorb the essence of the food or cloth offered to it. Hindu worshippers gain spiritual merit by making offerings to the god. They also gain a reputation as sacrifices, which enhances their standing in society. Yet puja at a temple is a comparatively rare event in the lives of most ordinary Hindus, who offer a daily puja to a small shrine in their own houses. Hinduism does not have a specific Lord's Day or Sabbath as Jews and Christians do, though Hindus do have frequent festivals to celebrate one or another god. One of the most famous of these festivals is the Ram Lila, or the drama of Ram, which is especially popular in North India. The Ramayana is nearly as popular and influential as the Mahabharata and its sacred chapters, the Bhagavad Gita. In the Ramayana, the god Rama takes on the human form of a prince. The story revolves around the kidnapping of Rama's wife, Sita, by a demon named Ravana. Rama and his brother Lakshmana search for Sita and her captor, and this leads to many adventures. Rama forms an alliance with Hanuman, and finally he and Lakshmana confront the demon on the island of Sri Lanka. Using Rama's divine power and the thousands of monkeys in Hanuman's army, the heroes kill the demon. During Ramlila, neighborhood associations sponsor a series of activities stretching over a week. Each night will feature performances by the neighborhood association to tell the story of the Ramayana. These plays give local amateur actors a chance to display their skills. The neighborhood association will also build a huge papier-mâché image of the demon Ravana. The culmination of the festival comes when this demon is set on fire. In the 11th century of the Common Era, a number of external and internal forces in India worked to shape Hinduism into its modern form. The first and most significant outside force was the arrival of the Muslims. 
Muslims from Central Asia and Afghanistan would have the greatest impact on Indian life. The Sultan Mahmud, the 10th and 11th century ruler of Ghazna in what is now called Afghanistan, ordered the first major Muslim invasions through the Khyber Pass. His primary motives were apparently economic. Mahmud wanted to turn his capital city, Ghazna, into one of the greatest cities of the Islamic world. He tried to attract all the leading poets, literary figures and scholars to his court, but that required more money than the kingdom produced. Mahmud therefore looked to the temples of neighboring India. Their treasuries were bulging with precious stones. Mahmud coveted the gold and silver objects, which in his eyes were dedicated to idolatry. This provided an excellent chance to combine sheer greed with religious zeal, and Muslim armies began to enter India on a regular basis. Mahmud of Ghazna was the first in a long line of Muslim conquerors and immigrants who came to India from Central Asia, Iran, and Afghanistan. All of these came to make their fortunes in India. Islam became important in India, and it influenced Hinduism in two ways. First, Islam's mysticism sometimes blended with Indian mysticism, and its monotheism sharpened Hinduism's monotheistic tendencies. Second, most Hindus rejected Islam, and through their negative reaction, they strengthened their own Hindu religious beliefs. Bhakti movements renewed Hinduism between the 9th and 18th centuries of the Common Era. Devotees were not interested in the dry philosophical doctrines of the Advaitins, who were discussing the ultimate and single reality of being. Bhakti devotees, instead, concentrated on the ecstatic love of God. They fully embraced the notions of sacrifice, surrender, and devotion all of which the word bhakti implies. The bhakti movements were also highly personal. Bhakti devotees worshipped God as a person, not as the featureless absolute being described by the Advaitins. Believers imitated the poet saints, who were central to bhakti. Stories from the lives of those ecstatic poets were well known. One of the most highly developed devotional movements was focused on a human known as Krishna. Krishna technically was believed to be an incarnation of Vishnu, but Krishna's followers identified him as being truly God. Vishnu was simply another name for him. Krishna's place in Hinduism was like that of Jesus in Christianity. Each was believed by his respective followers to be God incarnate, that is, God in the flesh. A number of the poet saints were women, and the bhakti movements often gave women a central and honored place. Krishna's consort, Radha, became the role model both for male and female believers. Radha's selfless devotion to Krishna became the model to follow for all Krishna's devotees. Throughout the 19th century, Hinduism gradually had become aware of itself in a new way. Now Hindus began to define themselves more sharply in contrast to other religions, such as Islam and Christianity. they arrived in India during the early 17th century, British merchants sought trade concessions from the Mughal emperors who were Muslims. After some time, they realized that most people were not Muslims. Only in the early 19th century did the term Hinduism come into wide use, and the Indians then picked up the usage from the British. A very confusing thing is that Hinduism is not an indigenous term at all. Hindus don't refer, didn't refer to themselves as Hindus before British times. Uh, British used the term 
in part as a way of distinguishing between Hindus and Muslims. It also became a matter of census and voting, which is that if you called yourself a Hindu, then you gave yourself more power, since there was more people who could call themselves Hindu, against Muslims. So the term is not indigenous at all. Now, of course, it's taken a life of its own. And it is used by people in India to describe these religions in South Asia. Religions excluding Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, and Jainism are all called Hinduism. It's an umbrella term. Ram Mohan Roy was one of the major figures involved in the modern development of Hinduism. Roy said the decline in Hindu beliefs and social customs was caused by centuries of Muslim rule. In his mid-twenties, Roy began to acquire land. He moved to Calcutta, the capital of British India. There he began lending money to the young Englishman who worked there for the East India Company. Eventually, Roy received a job in the East India Company's revenue administration, and this gave him even greater access to the British. Ram Mohan Roy celebrated British rule, which brought, in his words, the cheering influence of equitable and indulgent treatment. Roy believed British rule would enable Hindus to return to the pure teachings of the ancient past. Another trend that began in the 19th century was the tie between Hinduism and Indian politics. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was a leader who quickly realized that appeals to religion could mobilize the Indian masses. Tilak was an implacable opponent of British rule. Though trained in the law, he refused to have anything to do with a career in the British-run courts. Instead, he became the editor of a newspaper called Kesari, which was published in the Marathi language of Tilak's home area. Tilak's views led to several arrests for inciting anti-British feeling and communal discord. The British imposed strict censorship on political speech in India. When Tilak died in 1920, he probably was the most popular leader of the Indian National Congress Party. Nevertheless, his anti-British rhetoric had long-lasting consequences. Mohandas K. Gandhi was born in the tiny native state of Purbanda in Gujarat, on India's west coast. His father was prime minister to the area's ruler. Gandhi's kin group, the Bedi Banyas, were Hindu merchants. Over the centuries, they had deeply imbibed the ethical principles of Jainism, particularly the teachings of Ahimsa, or complete non-violence. Ahimsa really means uh, total non-violence, that is, non-violence in thought, word, and deed. And um, so this uh, philosophy of Ahimsa is uh, not really attainable by an individual, by any common person. But he perceived this as uh, a student who goes to school, and he or she aspires to get an A-plus grade. But not all students who go to school can get an A-plus grade, but every one of them aspires to get it. So in the same sense, we may not totally become nonviolent in our life ever, but we must constantly aspire to reach that uh, level, to whatever stage we can. During World War I, Gandhi worked hard to support the British cause. He expected that cooperation would bring later political concessions from the British Empire. Instead, the British enacted a series of extremely repressive laws that limited the political rights of Indians. Gandhi now became a strong opponent of British rule. Where once he had worn fashionable London-made suits and bowler hats, he began wearing the white loincloth and simple shirt of a wandering holy man. Gandhi began addressing the Indian masses in the language of religion. He described his tactics as satyagraha, a high-flown Sanskrit term meaning holding to the truth. Truth meant considerably. Uh, it was a, of gr tremendous importance to grandfather uh, in all his life. You know, at one stage he used to say, God is truth. And then later in his life he realized that truth is God. 
and that uh, what we are re really trying to do is to achieve that ultimate truth, and that is realization of God, uh, uh, Godhood. He called his movement uh, Satyagraha, which is a combination of two Sanskrit words, Satya meaning truth, and Agraha meaning pursuit of. And so he felt that uh, all of us individuals are constantly pursuing truth, that we have to honestly pursue truth if we seek salvation. <laughs> Gandhi had learned much from B.G. Tillak about using religion to move the Indian masses. Yet in contrast to Tillak's praise for violent political acts, Gandhi emphasized the tolerant and all-inclusive character of Hinduism. Gandhi became known while he lived as Mahatma, a title meaning great soul. As Mahatma, he tried to bring non-Hindus into the independence movement. He came to realize that India was made up of so many different religions. There the were very substantial Muslim population, a very substantial Christian population, and uh, people who believed in many other religions and uh, the tribal religions. So it was a, a conglomeration of many different uh, religious faiths. And we couldn't uh, wish them away. We couldn't declare India to be a Hindu country and forget the rest of the, the people there. It had to survive as a secular country, uh, which would give equal opportunities and equal rights to all the different religion and, and people who believed in those different religions. So when he realized all of these things were there, I think he uh, saw the wisdom in, in changing uh, the beliefs of the people. Between 1919 and 1924, he forged an alliance between the National Congress and a group of younger Muslim leaders. The alliance was always fragile. Gandhi kept employing Hindu symbols for political purposes. For example, he continually demanded that the Muslims' ritual cow slaughter be abolished. Muslims had no objection to eating beef, and on their feast commemorating Abram's sacrifice, they often slaughtered cows ritually. Like B.G. Tilak, Gandhi adopted the cow as a symbol of Hindu India. In his mind, Mother Cow was inextricably identified with Mother India. While Muslims sometimes found Gandhi too Hindu in his approach, Many others thought Gandhi was insufficiently Hindu. I don't think he was a Hindu in the traditional sense. Uh, he didn't practice any of the rituals of Hinduism. He didn't believe in all those rituals. Uh, he also believed in respect for all religions of the world. And so he studied, one, in fact, one of his famous sayings is that uh, a friendly study of all the scriptures is the sacred duty of every individual. And he made that friendly study. He studied uh, the Bible, he studied the Old Testament, he studied uh, the Quran and, and everything. So he studied all of these uh, scriptures and he took from each one of them what he thought was useful uh, in his own personal life and incorporated that in his uh, lifestyle. So he was able to show respect to all different religions and incorporate from that what he found useful. And uh, so in, in a sense, you might say that his uh, religion or his practice of religion, although um, very substantially Hindu, was also very substantially ecumenical. After World War II, British India was divided. A new country named Pakistan was primarily Muslim, 
and India had a majority of Hindus. Many millions of Muslims remained in India and Gandhi tried hard to heal the breach between Muslims and Hindus. People began to mock the Mahatma, calling him Muhammad Gandhi. In 1948, N. V. Godse approached Gandhi as he walked to a prayer meeting and shot him to death. As we can see, a debate continues within Hinduism itself over the character of the religion. Hinduism is not simply a living faith. It is also a lively faith, and a wide variety of beliefs and practices coexist within it. After almost 40 centuries, Hinduism is still in the making. No single version of it has completely dictated Hindu doctrines and values. Perhaps most remarkable of all is that a continuous religious tradition has survived and adapted over this long period. It is one of the oldest religions in the world. Despite the stresses and strains that it has endured, nearly one billion individuals in one way or another identify themselves as Hindus. Thank mm -hmm. you.